beginning of bismillah ta is for taqwa bewaring of allah and tha is for thawab a reward J is for jannah the garden of paradise ha is for hajj the blessed pilgrimage kha is for khatim the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd dear brothers and sisters in islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you live from Zad Studios. Uh, before we begin to take your calls, we have a number of um, emails coming to us. The first email is from Sultana and she says, if someone walks on the carpet with their shoes on, has that place become najis? If I want to pray there now when we would like to talk a little bit about this so that people would have sufficient knowledge because such questions are so basic and it is a fard it is mandatory upon you as a believer as a Muslim to know these issues of purity of tahara of when to pray and when not to pray this is basics ABC of Islam. So you have to learn this and you have to be able. There's no excuse for you not to know. So I, I know I'm, I'm going to take a lot of time, but it is something that has to be. The question is clear. Someone walked on a pit. So can I pray or consider it to be impure, uh, impure place to pray in? Definition of impurity. Impurity is known in Arabic as najasa. And it refers to the physical impurity because we have sentiment, moral impurity, which, which is something different. We're not going to talk about that. But physical impurity is urine of uh, human beings or of animals that we cannot and we're not allowed to eat their meat. The, the urine, the uh, uh, feet. Um, the menstrual blood of human beings or the, menis, uh, um, the blood of animals that we're not allowed to eat the meat or the blood that is running or gushing when slaughtering from a halal animal. These are the things that are known as najasa, physical. On to pray, one of the conditions of prayer is that my body my clothes, and the area I'm praying does not have any najasa. It is that people really mix up najasa with something that is dirty. So I have a dirt that is dirty, but I can still pray in it. Why? It is dirty because it has oil stains on it. I change oil and I have stains on it. It's smelly because I did not take a shower and I was sweaty and I it a couple of times or three times so it has a bad smell. By all standards, this is dirty. Yet, it is not najis. Najasa means impurity. And I could have a clean dress, a clean thobe, a clean shirt, but it has a tiny minute drop of urine that renders it to be najis, I cannot pray, and if I pray, my prayer is invalid. Combine this with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he, where he said that Allah has made the earth, the ground, for me a, a means of purification, that is through tayammum, and a place to pray. So whenever a person has to pray, can pray anywhere. And with the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, when he said, pray in your sandals. And whenever one of you wants to pray in his sandals, he should look at it, meaning at the soil, to ensure that there's no impurity and then pray. This is with your shoes on, with your sandals on, providing that there are no 
Najasa apparent on. All these previously said, if you come to the carpet house, walked with his boots, left traces of sand or, or, or soil or dust or whatever, do I see any visible Najasa? For certain, the answer is no. You, this means pray in a showroom, in a classroom. I can play in the corridor, I can play in the airport, wherever I want to pray because the ground is me, me, and I hope this answers your question. India. Uh, As-salamu alaykum. Uh, sir, I have, sir, I have three questions. Yes. Um, my first question is, what Islam says about such wives whose husbands are involved in sexual relationship with other ladies? What, does Islam, what does Islam say about what? Such wives whose husbands are involved in sexual relationship with other ladies. I don't understand. I, do you mean lesbians? Wife, yani wife. Uh, uh, what Islam says about such wives whose husbands are involved in ah. sexual relationship with other ladies. Okay, okay. Uh, here I'm talking about they accept by themselves about sexual relationship openly in front of wife, or somehow wife get to know. Then she asks from husband, then he do toba, ask wife to give him chance. Wife so give him for the sake of Allah and children, but he keep doing same sin repeatedly because of the addiction. He doesn't ready to leave this habit. So how can a wife forgive again and again? How can she live with such husband and the same roof where wife knows her husband has relationship with other ladies? So what is some guide in this scenario to such wife? Just do something for the sake of children or just because she is not financially strong and the parents of girl and family also not supportive. If she is not financially strong and has no segregated what? job, can she take Kula? What is the second question, not... Kalthum? Kalthum, what is your second question? Okay, sir. My second question is about dua. Like, if I'm making dua for someone in salah, in sujood, or out of the salah, so is it must uh, to mention his or her name? Like, if I want to make dua for my friend's easiness, so during salah in sujood, or out of the salah, must I have to utter her name? Uttering name of the person for whom you are making dua is must to accept them of dua? Number or three. Chances of, Number three. Uh, third question is about kafara. Like, how many types of kafaras are there in Islam, and for what things and what they are? About kafara. Like, how many types of kafaras are there in Islam, and for what things and what they are? Like, I know few kafara of during intercourse in Ramadan. Okay. Kafara of breaking out on wow, wow. Kafara of error in Hajj or Umrah. Kafara of killing human being, and kafara of abortion. Is there any other kafara also except the above mentioned? Okay, I will answer your questions, inshallah. And for having patience to listen to my long list of questions. Barakallah Fiki. Uh, Kalthum from India says that what is the ruling on husbands frequently cheating on their wives, being addicted to having affairs, and the wife forgives and he returns over and over again? What to do? You do not have a one size fits all answer. It all depends. If a woman can opt for divorce and have a normal life and have a sustainable source of income that does not require her to beg others, then definitely staying with such a man is not recommended. Because such men, first of all, do not fear Allah. Second of all, a woman is afraid that he may catch and transmit to her uh, uh, um, any disease, STD, for example. So for her own safety, she has to refrain from having intimacy with him because this guy is bad news. But if the woman is poor or her family are unwilling to take her back, or she's unable to leave him due to financial reasons, due to uh, social reasons, due to any reason. In this case, she has no other alternative but to be patient and to try and remind him of Allah, to uh, um, threaten him with Allah's punishment that he had placed in this dunya before the punishment in the grave, which is until the Day of Judgment, 
uh, before the punishment in hellfire for those who commit this heinous act of adultery. Now, usually, what drives a man out of his home is a number of reasons that none of them justify his heinous crime. But usually they would say, we don't have attention, our wives are not taking care of themselves, our wives do not request us, do not demand us, do not show any interest in us. So we look for it somewhere else. And this is a lame excuse and a justification that is worth not even the ink that it was written uh, in. Because the woman can say the same. Does this justify her committing the act of adultery as well? Of course not. So he is sinful. He's committing a major sin without any doubt in it. But if the woman sees that there is a chance and a room for uh, uh, reconciliation, she's advised to take care of herself really well. If she's fat, she has to get her act together. She has to work out, go on a diet, slim up again so that she would be pleasant for him to see. And not only that, she should exhaust him physically in bed every single night or more so that he wouldn't be even able to think about committing haram acts, let alone go and have relationships. And maybe with a lot of dua in sujood and asking Allah Azza wa to return him back to her, inshallah, there will be a way out. Second question of Kalthum is, can we supplicate to someone without mentioning his name? The answer is yes, but when I hear such questions, what comes up to my mind is how lazy we are when it comes to things that we beg from Allah Azza wa Jal. For example, people come and say, I make ruqya. So I recite the three qul. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Do I have to say bismillah in the beginning? <laughs> Subhanallah, the guy has jinn. He's got black magic, he's got envy or an evil eye. He wants and he needs Allah Azza wa to save him and cure him. Yet he's lazy to do the simple task of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And you want to make dua for a dear friend or a relative or someone you love and care about. You find it difficult and time consuming to say, Oh Allah, guide Abdullah to do whatever you, uh, you like or guide Abdullah to uh, uh, pray five times a day. You just want to say guide him. This is yeah, not logical, but because the question is, as you had heard, the answer is yes. If you use a pronoun and you refer to him by uh, um, uh, him or whatever, this is permissible, yet it is not uh, as best. The third question is a question that might need some thinking. She asked, what is the ruling on or what are the different types of kafarat, expiations? So we have the expiation of oath, feeding or clothing ten p uh, poor people uh, or uh, freeing a slave. Then we have the kafara for accidental killing, which is freeing a slave or fasting to uh, consecutive months. We have the kafara for intercourse during the daytime of Ramadan, freeing a slave or um, fasting to consecutive months or feeding 60 poor people if one is unable to do them uh, in order. Then we have the kafara of vihar, someone who says to his wife, you are haram to me as my mother's back or as my sister's back haram to me. So we know that there is a kafara in that. There are different kafarat for doing things that are prohibited in ihram. And this kafara is either fasting three days, feeding six poor people, or slaughtering a sheep. And there is a kafara in ihram and, uh, for amr or hajj if you abandon something that is mandatory, such as spending the night in 
مزدلفة, uh, in, uh, مزدلفة staying in Arafat until the sun uh, sets, etc. One of these mandatory things. So you have to, or not performing ihram from the real miqat, you have to slaughter a sheep. What else? There are, there might be some uh, more, but one has to sit down and look at it and think about it, and Allah Azza knows best. Uh, Asir from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, question number one uh, is, uh, are we allowed to make a cake for birthday? Okay. And question number two, uh, if suppose, uh, I mean, uh, any, any uh, non-mahram, can a man uh, make a dua for a woman who is not a mahram to him okay or uh, yeah and uh, just uh, office work and then uh, they're working together and then just make the was and all and exchange the was and all i mean is this uh, permissible okay i will answer you which is okay asif by from saudi yeah yeah yes sir i'm there are you there yes sir okay. you're on you're on uh, on air you're live so the, my second question you got it is regarding cutting hairs in case of emergency for women. I mean, if they have got very long hairs. I didn't hear your first question, Asif. Bhai. My first first question is regarding uh, when we are making vadu. Okay. And we have to wash uh, our faces uh, with beard. So what is the way? How to make sure that all of hairs are wet? Uh, just in. Brief. Okay. Second question. Regarding Second question is uh, for women, if uh, they are having kids and having long hair and they are not able to maintain, and they think uh, if they will cut by some long, uh, some small distances, maybe it will improve the quality. So can we can they do in these cases? Can they cut their hairs okay. from the? Okay. Uh, okay. okay. And uh, the, another question is regarding. Uh, I forget. You can I call again. No problem. Barakallah fiq. So Asya asks, what is the ruling on? preparing a birthday cake. See, the issue of birthdays is something that we Muslims do not have. And if you look at the time or the history 100 or 150 years ago, you will never find people celebrating their birthdays. This is something that came to us recently, either through uh, the conquest of uh, uh, Muslim worlds, uh, countries, or through people going to the West and adopting their customs and bringing it back to us. So the issue of having a birthday cake with candles, the number of your age, with singing happy birthday, happy birthday to you, dear so-and-so, happy birthday to you, and then blowing uh, uh, the candles in one breath, and then eating from that uh, a cake. This is not from the Muslim tradition, and hence, this is imitating the kuffar. It is not a religious celebration, but we are told not to imitate the kuffar, and hence, such celebration that comes over and over on a specific date, which is the date of birth, this is called Eid. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that there are only two Eids to be celebrated throughout the year for Muslims, and that is Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. Therefore, you must not participate in any gathering or celebration or even congratulating people by saying, happy birthday or giving them gifts on that occasion. Now, if you're the recipient, so it's my birthday today, today, and someone says, Salaamu Alaikum, happy birthday, I would not hang up. I would not curse the person or give him a lecture. I would just say, thank you. If someone comes and gives me a present, I would say, thank you. If someone gives me a piece of a cake of his brother's birthday and he brings it over to my office or my house i will eat it and i say thank you this is not taking part there is no problem in that but to initiate this yourself this is haram her second question 
is that can we make dua for the opposite gender who, are, who is not or her, she is not a mahram? The answer is yes. You can make dua because dua is something between you and Allah. However, in her questions, she said something that is that does not sound right. She said that the, we work together and working with non-mahram is totally prohibited in Islam. And we exchange dua, which means that the relationship is not kindly sign this paper or transfer this to office so-and-so or there's an, a client who would like to make an order. The relationship is far beyond that into chit-chatting, socializing, talking about their own uh, family problems and asking one another to make dua. And this is totally out of the question and it does not relate to Islam, none whatsoever. You must not work with the opposite gender, full stop. And definitely you must not socialize, even if he's teaching you the Quran and you're teaching him the Sunnah. This is totally prohibited in one of the easiest doors for shaitan, for Satan to enter from. And believe me, I have stories. <laughs> May Allah Azza wa have mercy upon us all. Stories that would make a child hair white because of such tricks of, that Satan plays uh, uh, over people like this and convince them that this is all for the sake of Allah and, and end up having these illicit uh, relationships. Asif says, how to wash the beard when I'm performing wudu? One of two, either your beard is thick and you cannot see the skin. And in this case, washing the face once, twice, or thrice, and then put water in your hand and just try to, it, with that one scoop of water, get as much as possible to your beard. This is what the Prophet used to do, alayhi wasalam. The second uh, beard or type is when your beard is thin and you actually can not see uh, the skin underneath and it's very short. And in this case, washing your face would also mean that you rub your beard because the, the hair would be penetrated with the water, inshallah, and this would suffice. Uh, the, third, uh, the second and last question, can a woman cut short her hair? The answer is yes. Whether it's damaged or not, whether she wants to have a new look, this is up to her. Cutting the hair is permissible for a woman, providing that she's not cutting it short so that people would think that this is the hair of a man. This is haram. And she's not allowed to have haircuts that are only done by the kafir. Yani Muslim women do not do this. So if a woman uh, uh, almost shaves the side of her head and having the other hair uh, grown uh, and long, this is totally prohibited. Because this is the haircut of a kafir, of a disbeliever. But if it's the normal haircut, whether it is, as they call it, Princess Diana's haircut uh, or something similar to that, which all women do it, whether here or there, there is no problem in that, inshallah, and Allah knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that a man came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, poverty has struck me. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a messenger to one of his wives to bring something for that man to eat. But she said, by the one who sent you with the truth, I only have water. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to another one of his wives to bring something for the man to eat. But she said the same until all of them said the same thing. Then Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Who will take this one as a guest in exchange for Allah's mercy? A man from the Ansar said, I will, O messenger of Allah. So he took the man to his home and said to his wife, 
treat the guest of the messenger of Allah well. She said, by Allah, we have nothing except the meal for my children. He said, get the food ready and light the lamp and put your children to sleep. If they ask for dinner, then when the guest enters, dim the lamp and make it seem as if we are eating. And when he reaches for the food to eat, then stand up to the lantern and turn it off. She got the food ready, turned the lamp on, and put the children to sleep. She then went to the lamp as if she was fixing it, and turned it off. Then they pretended as they were eating, and they both went to sleep hungry. In the morning, the man from the Ansar went to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said, Allah has laughed, implying his acceptance to the deed from your actions last night. Then Allah revealed his saying, which means, and they give them preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Um, let us see what emails do we have. We have uh, um, an email from Hira and she and he or she, I don't know, says that is it okay to work in an Islamic window of conventional banks if all of its operations are independent of the conventional bank and not controlled by conventional heads? The answer is yes, this is permissible. And how to look at this? A conventional bank, such as Citibank, Barclays, uh, HSBC, whatever, they are RIBA-based bank. It is totally prohibited to work for them because they lend in with interest and they borrow with interest, whether in the department, whether in the credit, or whether in the financing, it's all haram. But some of them would have a branch headed by a banker with Islamic banking experience, and they allocate the money deposit when they open a bank account, they allocate a deposit when they open a bank account, they allocate it in a separate account that does not mix with the conventional bank. And they go even further to rent their own premises from their own money and their own transactions. And they have this Islamic windows, meaning that all the transactions whether it's financing, it's selling an installment, uh, um, uh, letter of credit, etc. All of this is under the Sharia board rulings that gives them the green light to do these things. So if this is the case and it's totally independent from the conventional bank and the transactions are okay, then inshallah it is halal to work there. Hamna says, Having dogs is haram as a pet, but is it allowed to be a veterinarian, a veterinarian? I think this is what they call a vet, and check a dog and touch it? The answer is yes. A dog is a, an animal. It's a living creature. And we are told that a prostitute was forgiven all of her sins just because she provided drinking water to a thirsty dog. So being kind to dogs has nothing to do with having them as pets. Keeping them as pets is totally prohibited. It deducts from your good deeds the weight of one carrot, which is equivalent to the mountain of Uhud, of good deeds. Just because you have one, a dog, and this is every single day. But to be a vet and people bring their dogs and you look whether they need vaccinations or they need any uh, medical assistance and you provide this, this is totally legit and, and, and permissible. There's nothing wrong in that, inshallah. Asiya from Saudi. 
السلام علیکم شیخ سلام و رحمت الله شیخ سونی تو کال یو اگین دسٹرب یو آئی جس وانٹی تو آسک دا پرسن از آسکنگ ویدر اٹ از الاؤڈ تو آئی مین میک اے ویڈنگ کیک آئی مین ویڈنگ ویڈنگ کیک از آلسو ناٹ الاؤڈ بیکاز شی از میکنگ اے ویڈنگ کیک اینڈ سیلنگ دا ویڈنگ کیک Okay. So is this allowed? And uh, regarding that uh, making dua for non-mahram in that office, it, I myself is not doing shaykh. Allah khal bala kuhata. Alhamdulillah. But there is, yes, yeah, Allah, Allah protect me from all these things. Uh, I mean, but the, in this Saudi Arabia, in this Jadda only, uh, I, this chat thing is happening and I have seen this and very close uh, person is doing this. And then when I, I told them not to do it, they are saying you are going to extremism. Dua is for anyone. You can make up for kafir also when so what's there. I mean, you are going towards ex- extremism. That's why I just wanted to confirm whether I'm extremist or not. Okay. Jazakallah. Oh, jazak. uh, Asya's question uh, regarding wedding cake. Now, a wedding cake is something totally different. Why is a birthday cake haram? We've explained this before the break because this is imitating the West. A cake for your weddings, a cake for your child passing the exams, a cake for your uh, husband coming out of hospital after uh, passing Uh, and having an operation that was successful, all of these are permissible. There's nothing wrong in that. Unless your husband is diabetic, then stay away from cakes. But to do these things, this is not something that is being a celebration we are told not to uh, have. Yani for example, if one wants to make a cake for an anniversary, we say that this is not uh, legit. Um, because anniversaries are not part of Islam, birthdays are not part of Islam, Mother's Day, Labor's Day, um, Valentine, oh, um, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Though they do not have religious background, but it is part of imitating the kuffar. So contributing to facilitate such a sin would be sinful. Now, for the cake maker, for the bakery, for the woman doing this, if she doesn't know the occasion, they have no problem. Someone calls and places an order for a Fioriche chocolate cake. She says, okay, prepare it, s- deliver it, charge for it, alhamdulillah. But if someone says, I have a birthday today and I want you to make me a cake, you cannot do that. But if you don't know the reason, and no one tells you whether it's halal or haram occasion, the default is that it is a halal occasion and there's nothing wrong in doing it. Asif from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I missed one question, just uh, that one. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is actually, you know, we are a joint family and uh, we have a worship group uh, around uh, 15, 20 people. And in fact, uh, our kids, or uh, my sisters and daughters, uh, my sister and uh, brother's kids also are a part of that. So most of the time, you know, everybody, someone has got a birthday and all. Uh, we, they used to wish and all. I used to give some dawa and some Islamic lectures, but every time I don't uh, do this. So what is the way? Because I see that it has been increasing gradually, that uh, it was like uh, awarded in the beginning, but right now it has been shifted to these uh, celebration like burden and all. So what is the way? Do I exit the group or do I uh, talk to them sometime uh, saying... Uh, Um, and they're sharing videos and all, or what is the way to move ahead on this? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Yeah. Barakallah feek. Asiya's second question was about a clarification over her previous question about making dua for non mahram. And she is telling me that she noticed that this is becoming an, the norm uh, uh, everywhere. And unfortunately, this is true. The issue of men and women working together, mixing together, is becoming natural, becoming normal. People are being accustomed to it, and rarely you will find people standing up and saying that this is haram, this is munkar. And even parents and families are gone with the flow. 
So everybody's doing it. My cousin is doing it. My neighbor is doing it. Why not me? Don't you trust me? You, up, you, you brought me up in an Islamic way. I'm abiding by the hijab. I am a respected woman. Nobody can uh, uh, transgress against me. And under pressure, they allow. Only, unfortunately, to hear a few months, maybe a year or two later, of something that breaks our hearts. So being there and taking place in front of us does not make it legal. As Muslims, anything that goes or happens in front of us, we have to cross-examine it with the Quran and Sunnah. If the Quran and Sunnah say, okay, halas, we're okay with that. But if the Quran and Sunnah say, this is prohibited, and everyone else say, no, this is permissible, who do you follow as a Muslim? This is what defines, this is what defines your Islam. If you decide to follow the, the, the flock and be a part of it, then you go with them to hell. Because you defied Allah's instruction and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you hold your grounds and say, Sami'na wa ata'na, we adhere and we listen and obey. In this case, you will be with the Prophet ﷺ, no matter what happens to you. So uh, uh, this is very unfortunate. And the free mixing that is taking place is not something that Allah Azza wa is pleased with nor that it goes along with the Islamic teachings. Asif says, nowadays, these birthdays are prevailing and they're taking place over and over with our relatives, with the children of the cousins and brothers and sisters and the in-laws. So what to do? Akhi, again, the same answer. You have to hold your grounds. Is it something that Islam allows? Was it something that the Prophet did, alayhi salam, or the companions, or the tabi'een, or the tabi'i tabi'een? If the salaf of our ummah did not do it, and it is not something that is known from our tradition and customs, rather it is known from their tradition, and this is why we use their cake, their candles, and their song as well. In, in, in Arabic, sana hilwa ya gamil, in the same tone, the same melody. This is taken from them all the way. Therefore, you have to draw the line because if you don't, eventually your children would demand having birthdays themselves. Why is my cousin having a birthday and you're attending and today is my birthday and you're not throwing a party? But having said that, you have to compensate the children. If the children want to go and you prevent them, you have to give them an alternative. Take them to the fun fairs, take them to the corniche, to the beach, Let, give them a day out, uh, give them some quality time if you can afford that, so that they would feel that there's a balance. But if we, and unfortunately we all do this, if we are good in prohibiting things, haram, 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 it's imitating, it is... Uh, 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 not part of our Islam, it's an innovation, but we fail to give alternatives. Then we're actually pushing our children to go to the other side, which is something we don't want, and may Allah protect us all. Uh, a person who did not say his name, an anonymous person says, must a girl be dead serious during a marriage meeting because the suitor is not her mahram? Or can she let her personality show because she is <coughs> his potential wife to see if he likes it and vice versa? I think the question is clear, what the sister is asking. So she is saying that if someone comes to propose, my father meets him and he thinks that he, and he checks on him and he passes. So... My father arranges for a meeting, which is an interview, which is part of the sunnah, where the girl gets to look at the boy, the boy gets to look at the girl, and 
they're not ordered to lower their gaze, rather they're ordered to look and take a good look and talk for an hour or so just to try to find means and ways of liking one another in order to proceed with the marriage or proposal or to decline. So she's saying that must she be dead serious in this meeting? Meaning, uh, do you go to college? Yes. Uh, do you like uh, desserts? Not much. And it goes like an interrogation? No, of course not. She's allowed to look at him, to exchange questions, to be humorous, to um, let down her guard in a sense, but not to be a stand-up comedian, not to crack jokes and uh, uh, sit on uh, the arms of the chair or hang from the chandelier just to make him laugh. No, a, a person by nature, a Muslim by nature, has to be respectful, has to have his dignity. There's no problem in being humorous, being funny, having good remarks, showing that, yes, this or that, giving a remark here or there, but not to the extent of being a comedian or a clown. So the answer is to take the middle path, not to be so frank, uh, that is, so serious, and rigid, and at the same time not to be so loose and uh, um, doing something impulsively that would put a bad impression against you uh, in his mind, and Allah knows best. Afrin says, I know that nothing can, ca uh, can succeed without the permission of Allah. However, am I supposed to continuously or consciously Remind myself of this before doing or saying something. For example, saying a product works well without saying Alhamdulillah out loud. Or reminding myself about Allah, but giving the belief that nothing takes place without the permission of Allah. The question is a little bit vague. If you have the conviction that everything is successful by the will of Allah Azza wa Jalla. You don't have to say, Alhamdulillah, my car works. Someone says, how's your car today? And you say, my car, my car works fine. That's good. But it, what would it hurt you to say, Alhamdulillah, it works fine? Or I'll fix your car and it, it should work fine with the grace of Allah. There's nothing wrong in always attaching the praise of Allah or the will of Allah with whatever you are doing as long as you have this conviction in your heart, saying it is rewarding, uh, inshallah, as well. Saad says, there is a game which my brother plays. It has a gun named as Armageddon, which most, most likely is the Christian name of the Malhamatul Kubra, the big battle in the, at the end of times. Is there anything wrong in playing such games just because of such a name? The answer is no. The name itself has no significance, whether in Arabic or in English. So if I call my car Al-Malhamatul Kubra, there's no, no problem in that because I'm not referring to the battle itself. It's just a name. And like uh, uh, so with Armageddon. But when you come to video games nowadays, it is a bit problematic because it is based on violence. So whether it is PUBG, PUBG or whatever they call it, or Fortnite or whatever, it is based on killing your opponent, using different techniques, hurting others. Now one says, okay, this is a game. And the answer is, yeah, it is a game. I'm not actually doing it, of course, but what are the implications of playing such a game? What is the psychological impact on our children? It would increase their violence. It would make them violent. And there is almost certainly a lot of music involved and maybe sometimes some nudity introduced. And a fighter can be a woman, the one who gives you the prize 
can be a woman in a, in a bikini or something like that. So destruction, killing, and maybe sometimes if it has to do with Islam, it tells you if you bomb a masjid, you get 100 points. And if you bomb a house in Baghdad or in uh, uh, Kab Kabul in Afghanistan, you get 50 points. So it turns you around and against your Islam without knowing. I personally believe that such games are bad influence, and we should not allow our children to play with such games, and Allah Azza wa knows best. A sister says, a woman's postpartum bleeding stopped at 45 days. After that, she's having yellow discharge, and it's been 62 days after the birth of the baby, till the end of her question, and she says, um, can she have intimacy with her husband? The answer is she's sinful for waiting these five days after the 40 days. The postnatal bleeding max period is 40 days after giving birth. If she's clean or pure before that, she must take ghusl and resume prayer and she can have intimacy with her husband. If not, once she finishes the 40th day, by default, the, whatever she's getting with a yellowish, brownish discharge or continuous bleeding, this is not considered part of her postnatal bleeding, and she has to perform ghusl. She can pray fast, and her husband can have intimacy with her as well. So the answer to her question, these yellow discharges are not to be con uh, uh, taken care of uh, or be concerned with. She should have her ghusl on the 40th day, and she can pray fast and have intimacy with her uh, husband. Shamir says, must we say Bismillah before reciting Ayat al-Kursi or Aman al rasulu Do we need to say A'udhu Billah min al shaytan al rajim every time before Bismillah? The answer would be, Bismillah is an ayah, it's a verse of the Quran that separates surah from surah. So if I recited the Fatiha غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين and I would, I would like to recite قل أعوذ برب الفلق The Sunnah is to recite secretly بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق This is the Sunnah. If someone skips it, this does not invalidate nor affect his prayer. So this is with the بسم الله. As for أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم, this is Sunnah whenever you want to recite the Quran whether from the beginning or from the end. But Bismillah is recited only when you recite a surah from the very beginning, with the exception of surah number nine, which is surah At-Tawbah. As for A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, if you're reciting a surah from the middle, yes. But for the athkar, such as Ayat Al-Kursi, or the last two ayahs for, uh, of surah Al-Baqarah, you do not have to do this. You just go ahead and recite it. Sharif says, the, word, the world is a dangerous place and there are certain events we learn about in the news which seem completely outrageous that people are talking about all the time. He says that, are we supposed to read and form an opinion and discuss things with others or should we simply say Allah knows best and find something else to occupy our time, definitely occupying yourself with something that is beneficial is more uh, uh, advisable and it's better than talking about news that you have not seen, you've not been there, and you only took it from dubious sources like the CNN, the BBC, etc. So how would I base my knowledge over something through their eyes. And I know that they are habitual liars. I cannot trust them. And why would I trust them? Am I going to hold something accountable for something? This is not my business. So focus on what benefits you because Allah on the day of judgment will not ask you, why didn't you form an opinion about so and so event that took place here or there. Allah will not ask you about this, but Allah will indeed ask you, why did you say what you had said 
about a specific Muslim or a country or a group and you had no knowledge, you were not a witness, you were not involved, it's all hearsay. The Prophet said, It is sufficient sin upon you to just relay and repeat what you had heard. This is sufficient sin. You don't need any more sins to be punished on the Day of Judgment. This is a serious issue that people should learn how to keep a lid on it. Fatima says, is it permissible to own and use backpack that has animals on it? The picture of animals, if it's a drawing, then you should not keep it and you should dispose of it. It's, if it's just a photograph, a real photograph, not photo sh uh, uh, shop and, and not uh, change or, or, or edit it, there's no problem in uh, having such a bag. To stay away just to be safe rather than sorry is better. A sister says, I'm getting married soon, but I don't have a father. So she, in, in, in short, is her brother, who is a cousin, legible to be uh, her guardian? His brother through suckling. If she has no blood relatives except this cousin, and he is a paternal cousin, not a maternal, so he is having and carrying the same name, then yes, he is her guardian. Suckling has nothing to do with it. If he is from her mother's side, in this case, no, he cannot be her guardian, and her guardian must be the Muslim ruler, if not the Muslim judge, if not then the authorized imam of the Islamic center. Mehwish says, can you please explain the step-by-step -step process of how to make ghusl and how to make the quickest ghusl? Can we do quick ghusl if we want purity, uh, to purify ourselves from menses? The answer is yes. Ghusl is one, which is to intend to uplift the major ritual impurity by covering your whole body with water and turning the water in your mouth and rinsing your nose. So the sunnah way is to first of all, wash your hands three times, wash your private part, then wash your hand again with a detergent so that no najasa is there. Then perform wudu, normal wudu, with the exception of the feet, don't wash them. Then take three scoops of water and wash your hair thoroughly reaching the scalp. Then pour water over your whole body, wash your feet, that's it. This is the sunnah. The other way is just simply take a full shower that uh, uh, cleans your body with rinsing your mouth and nose. Mufid says, is it allowed to use mouthwash with, uh, which contains alcohol? The answer is yes. And finally, sister says, I'm 32 years old. Uh, I suffer from a mental illness since six years ago, which I'm still taking medication. Can I hide my illness from my future husband? This answer is, if your illness affects your marriage and your husband's interest in you, you must disclose that. So if it's an illness that is diminishing and going away, it doesn't affect your household work, it doesn't affect you uh, when it comes in regards of intimacy or dealing with the husband, then you don't have to tell him. But if it's something that touches the core of the marriage and he would be feeling cheated not to have known and it would affect your relationships, in this case, you must disclose that and tell him and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have. Until we meet same time next week, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam